Thank you. Please have a seat and be comfortable. I would like to start with your indulgence with 60 full seconds of quiet prayer. And for those of you who are open to a suggestion as to how to pray, I would suggest, only as a suggestion, the Zen meditation method, also known as the mindfulness method. The invitation is simply to follow the breath in and notice the breath going out for 60 seconds. And as you notice your mind straying onto other thoughts, your laundry list, what you want to watch on TV later, disturbing aspects of the gospel, delightful aspects of the gospel, whatever, the invitation is simply to return to your breath in and out in full knowledge that the Spirit is with us. I'll be in charge of counting the 60 seconds. Ding! Welcome back. It is a great honor that I've been invited to return to St. George's Anglican Church for another sermon at the Wednesday night sermon series. The gospel reading for this evening is a very challenging one. It contains, at, at the same time, the beauty of the Magi's visit and the terror of the flight into Egypt and the massacre of the infants. A gospel reading of many textures. I have the privilege, which I am totally incapable of fulfilling, of unpacking what we learn about Mary in this gospel passage and through Mary of God. Easy to do in a few minutes, right? Oh, someone laughed. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm intimidated, but I ask for your patience and your forbearance as I try my very, very best. St. Augustine said that the true blessing that Mary enjoyed was not in her motherhood, but in her discipleship. I think this is a beautifully feminist statement from St. Augustine in that it encourages us to move away from seeing Mary as, in a limited way, defined by her maternity, and unto seeing Mary as a, a fulsome spiritual being with a prophetic mission of her own. I think that the way to make sense of Mary's experience in the flight to Egypt is certainly through the prism of the Magnificat, that beautiful text from the Gospel of Luke, in which Mary proclaims to her cousin Elizabeth that the, her God, our God, is the God who brings the mighty down and brings the lowly and the humble up. With the Magnificat in mind, I'm going to proceed 
to a consideration of the passage we've heard this evening. And the passage, for me, is fundamentally about refugeedom. This is a term that has a lot of meanings for me. Uh, coincidentally, right before our service began tonight, I was chatting with my colleague, Sylvia Dimitrova, who is a lawyer who works with me at the Niagara Community Legal Clinic, about a client she was working with this afternoon, a Haitian refugee seeking protection in Canada. At the most literal level, the flight to Egypt of the Holy Family is about refugees, some of the most vulnerable people on our planet. And when we think of Mary's experience as a refugee, we're called in a very particular way to reflect on the unique vulnerability of female refugees and of gender non-conforming and transgender and queer refugees. The gospel, in a very explicit way, invites us to remember that our Lord didn't come to earth with power and wealth. Gospel 101, Jesus came to earth as the defenseless baby of an illiterate peasant Jewish refugee who was fleeing to Egypt with her husband. Not to be too heavy-handed about the point, but the gospel is very clearly inviting us to recall our moral duty to do everything we can for the cause of refugees in the world, whether they be the Rohingya or whether they be the refugees of myriad nations who seek to enter Canada. We have an obligation in terms of foreign aid to refugees, and we have an obligation as Canadians to open our border to refugees. To do anything less would be to turn our backs on the Holy Family as the Holy Family is presented to us in tonight's Gospel reading. For me, refugeedom has a deeper meaning. I am a queer person and a gender non-binary person. And from my place as a, a queer person with a complex gender identity, over the, the 40 years so far of my existence, I've gotten to know Mary, also known as the Mother of God, the Queen of Angels, the Queen of Heaven. She goes by many names. Mary has a very special relationship with LGBTQ people. We could start with her irregular pregnancy, which complexifies gender in a myriad of ways. We could move on to her ministry of compassion and her ministry of love. In a very special way tonight, we see Mary as a refugee. And for LGBTQ people, the parallel is unmistakable. In that, queer people, gender non-binary people, gay and lesbian people, transgender people, and indeed women as a broad category in any unique way, are refugees. We are refugees from patriarchy. We are refugees from transphobia and homophobia. We are refugees from murderous government policies that would kill us in all kinds of ways. Whether it is Donald Trump's ban on transgender people serving in the United States Armed Forces, a policy that is destroying transgender lives as we speak, or whether here in Ontario we think of Doug Ford's destruction of the sex ed curriculum that was put in place by the previous government, a sex ed curriculum that sought simply to tell transgender and gay and lesbian students in our public Ontario schools that they are fully human. The trampling of that policy is murderous in its own way. And I would go so far as to say that we see a parallel to Herod's slaughtering of the innocents in these transphobic and misogynistic and anti-queer policies that are still being instituted by the bloody hands of governments in our own day. In this way, sadly, there is no shortage of refugees in our contemporary world. And in a very true way, the Holy Family continues to flee. There's good news, and the gospel points to it. <laughs> 
what was Mary's experience as a refugee? Mary, of necessity, was reflecting on her own situation. And I can't help but conjecture that when Mary returns into Israel and into Galilee after her exile in Egypt and learns the news of what Herod has done in the slaughtering of the innocents, that Mary has a very complicated reaction. On the one hand, inevitably, of course, gratitude for the fact that she has survived. This points to what I might call the discipleship of survival. If we're studying Mary's discipleship, recalling Augustine's profound thought that Mary's true blessing was one of discipleship rather than of motherhood, I think that we see in the story tonight a discipleship of survival. Mary did not have the power to end or prevent the slaughter of the innocents, nor did Mary have the power to prevent her family from turning into a refugee family. What Mary had the power to do was to survive. And therefore, I submit to you that when we invest in our own self-care, in whatever way is uh, creating of true compassion toward ourselves, in terms of taking care of our mental health and our physical health. And to be clear, I, I don't mean the mental health and physical health of those around us, though of course we have to do that too. And needless to say, Mary was taking care of Jesus and Joseph on the road. I, I'm speaking in a more uh, limited way of self, true self-care. Mary surviving. Mary letting herself go into exile so as not to be the mother of a dead baby and not do that to her child and not do that to herself. When we invest in self-care, we are embodying God's love for us. Sometimes we, sometimes we have to be the love for ourselves. And uh, those of you who are, uh, who are queer or who are allies of queer people will understand the unique way in which this manifests in queer lives. In such a, in a world, in a society as hostile as ours, so often LGBTQ people and our allies have to be compassion for ourselves because if we are not, no one else will be. So on one level, a, a discipleship of self-care is illustrated for us in the gospel tonight. But Mary returns to Israel after the exile to Egypt, learns of the slaughter of the innocents. She is a human being. And for that reason, her reaction cannot be, could not have been, simply one of gratitude and self-congratulation for her own survival. The text tonight is profoundly feminist. And there are two ways I want to point to my meaning when I say that the gospel passage tonight is profoundly feminist. And if you will permit me, in talking about how the gospel is feminist in two particular ways, I seek to shed some light onto Mary's reaction to the slaughter of the innocents and what that reaction might mean for us today. In what way is the gospel passage feminist? Well, for starters, Mary is paralleled with a magus, a wise man. The second chapter of Luke, as we heard beautifully read, begins with the visitation of the wise men to the stable in Bethlehem, bringing gold and frankincense and myrrh. They know that if they go back to Herod, terrible things are going to happen to the Holy Family. Terrible things might happen to them. So they go home by another road immediately after the Holy Family sets out on the flight to Egypt. The parallel is unmistakable 
one trio going by a road that that trio wasn't intending on, and another trio fleeing to Egypt down a road that they didn't plan on. Mary is paralleled with a wise man. Mary has things to teach us, says the gospel. Second striking literary feminist aspect of the gospel reading this evening, the invocation of Rachel. Right after the narration of the slaughter of the innocents, Matthew recalls Rachel crying out for her children, not just Joseph and Benjamin, but all the slaughtered children of Israel, her children as a, a mother of the nation of Israel from the book of Jeremiah in the Hebrew Bible. And Rachel's lamentations were deep, and Rachel could not be consoled. It seems to me inevitable that when we ask ourselves, what must Mary have felt during the flight to Egypt, in Egypt, and upon returning to Judea after her exile, upon realizing that she had survived, and so many infants her own sons aged had not. Inevitably, when we hear about Rachel's lamentation echoed in the Gospel of Matthew, we are hearing of Mary's lamentation. We are hearing Mary's anguish and outcry at the injustice that has been perpetuated by Herod in, in her nation. And in, inevitably, when we reflect on Rachel's cry for her children murdered by systemic and misogynistic injustice in ancient Israel, echoing through Israel's history to the time of Mary and from the time of Mary into our own time when innocents are constantly slaughtered in so many contexts, queer contexts and non-queer contexts, in, in refugee communities and in communities impacted by disease and poverty and injustice the world over, we hear something profound and something eternal of Mary's discipleship, which is a discipleship of crying out and a discipleship of standing in constant solidarity with the victims of injustice. In my hypothetical imagining of Mary's experience, I can't help but think that Mary also turned her mind to Herod himself. And I, I did some reading about Herod this afternoon, and historians have a very interesting debate about King Herod. They praise his, his achievements in government and his achievements in building great works of architecture in ancient Judea, and historians now, uh, in, in terms of a majority of historians, think that the slaughter of the innocents in the book of Matthew, and this is very good news, never actually happened. As a historical event, the slaughter of the innocents probably did not take place. Rather, we see it in, in a literary way, reflected in the murders and massacres that, that are so often a part of, of history and of modern society. But in terms of the context of the story, on the one hand, needless to say, Mary must have hated Herod. She must have hated Herod the way that we hate the dictators and the fascists and the terrible politicians who wield power today. She must have hated Herod the way that so many of us who are queer hate the bishops, I'm, and I'm Roman Catholic, the cardinals and the popes who continue to participate in the murder and the marginalization of queer people and women and other sorts of vulnerable people who are victimized by Christianity itself the world over. Mary must have felt this sorrow and Mary must have felt this rage. At the same time, however, because we're Christians, we're constantly, constantly invited to try opening ourselves to love and mercy and justice, even for those who oppress us. In the story of the flight to Egypt, it seems to me that we are 
hearing the story of, uh, in miniature of a crucifixion and of a resurrection unto forgiveness and unto love. Mary, in this instance, is indeed a kind of a crucified Christ figure. Her refugeedom is a kind of state execution. Hosea, the, the prophet Hosea, is quoted in tonight's gospel reading. From Egypt I send my son. In a, in a grand prophetic way, the gospel states that the Holy Family's flight into Egypt was necessary so that the great Savior of the world could be proclaimed as, as coming unto the world from Egypt, the place of slavery and degradation and shame for the Jews. From the place of shame, from the place of marginalization, Egypt comes the ministry of Jesus and the discipleship of Mary, which is all about love and inclusion and, in the words of the Magnificat, the mighty being brought down and the lowly and the humble being brought up. When Mary reflects on Herod, it must have been with a kind of pity in addition to her rage and in addition to her sorrow. For she knew, just as she knew when she visited Elizabeth and sang the song of the Magnificat, that inevitably the mighty are brought low and the meek are made high. In a very real way, and I'm, I'm going to return to the theme of LGBTQ because uh, it's the story I have to tell. It's very much um, the lens inevitably through which I wind up uh, reading the Gospels. I cannot help but reflect that in a very real way, the place of shame and marginalization to which queer people have been exiled so often by the church and by our own families, on the one hand, is a place of death and a place that is soaked with blood. However, what we're seeing these days among LGBTQ people and um, among refugees uh, when and where we're able to help them. Indeed, among all marginalized groups who are able to find solidarity and find justice and find their way toward reconciliation and truth. What we are seeing is the return to Israel, the new exodus, the emergence from shame, the leaving behind of the place of shame and the place of marginalization and the place of injustice, and a proud claiming of the promised land, the place of equality, the place where we can finally relax and no longer be refugees, a place where we can, in truth, realize that Herod is our brother. For all of the evil that is around us, for all of the evil that is perpetuated by the Trumps, by the Fords, by the bishops, by the popes who, who, who would uh, preach a perverse gospel of misogyny, of homophobia, of transphobia, for all of these evil voices, for all of these Herods making new refugees, new holy families on the run, in our midst every single day, for all of that darkness, we have communities like this. We have places to which we can go where we find love and where we find healing. We have true holy families. For this blessing, I will always be grateful. And I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to think through a very hard passage from the Gospel of Matthew. I wish all of you a very beautiful Lent. Namaste.